Hey guys, uh, my Vernicator, how's everybody doing um, on their end? Um, welcome back to, this is basically the final um, reviews of uh, my comic reviews on my main channel. Um, we're doing a little experiment um, and uh, kind of can say the experiment was a little bit of a success. Uh, but once again, um, these are the final reviews uh, for the books that came out for September of uh, 2016 and um, so we are uh, and then of course when the new books come out this week uh, they'll go back on my comic central channel everything will be back on that show so once again annotation up in the corner if you want to continue to look at my weekly comic reviews and things like that then you go to that channel after this that's it uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break these up uh, the final books that came out for September I'm gonna break it up into uh, three parts um, they're gonna be the indie books the DC books and the, and, and the Marvel books each uh, sec each uh, part is gonna get its own section so I'm gonna talk about the indie books that I got this uh, the final week of September uh, I got books from Archie Comics uh, Dark Horse uh, uh, Joe Benez, uh, Chap Chap Chapter House, uh, Joe Books, uh, Udon, uh, Vertigo. Yeah, I know Vertigo is uh, a subsidiary of, of DC, but I still consider Vertigo independent. Um, Valiant, and of course, uh, Xenoscope. So let's kick it off with um, the. Uh, Archie Comics. Oh, one thing also. Um, once again, everybody who wants to see what did I think of the Luke Cage series, um, you you once go look at the annotation before keep those annotations on. You'll see I did a full Luke Cage uh, Netflix uh, Luke Cage series uh, review. It's up. Um, thank you everybody for uh, hitting that like button and uh, enjoying my view. I didn't spoil too much for you guys, so if you haven't seen it. You, you won't be too spoiled but let's get right back into the review shall we um we're gonna start off with um uh josie and the pussycats yeah um this is the all new series that is written by marjorie bennett no relation to me uh she find that she finds that joke pretty funny uh i tweeted her and i, I said that and she finds that joke funny i say that a lot marjorie bennett because my last name is Bennett too, so I kind of, uh, we I joke about that a lot. But um, uh, she writes it. Uh, Cameron Diario uh, uh, does the artwork. Uh, first of all, I got the Valiant cover. I got this sweet Valiant cover. I thought this cover when I saw all the covers, I thought this one, this one really attracted me. I was like, oh, that's cool. So um, this does take place in Riverdale. Same universes archie and everybody like that but um this is a lot different than we got in the cartoon and everything like that and um but it still holds that M miss bennett still gives that essence of the classic cartoon so uh so in this josie is kind of a struggling artist you know she 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 doesn't really garner the attention of the audience you know she what I got from this was a little bit of a Phoebe Buffay vibe from Friends. How uh, she she doesn't really have a good voice, but she wants to go as a solo artist. But she she's not getting a lot of attention. You know, remember Phoebe? How she would sing these weird songs, and but you know, people would just be there. You know, things like that. Uh, Alexandra is in this, of course, and she's like. Josie's biggest critic and kind of keeps the essence of Alexandra um, But is always talking smack about Josie and things like that and you know, then she meets her roommate is Melody You know and Melody still kind of has that free spirit vibe that she's had from the com from the cartoon and everything like that um, but she She's not as ditzy as how she was in the, her cartoon counterpart, you know, kind of like Almost like uh, you know, Melanie may have been taking a little bit too much of uh, 
But she, you know, that's what I'm saying. Too. But no, and this, she's kind of like, she's just a free spirit. And of course, they meet Valerie. You know, Valerie, who is, who works, She, I think she's a veterinarian at, at trade, but she loves to sing and she has this beautiful voice, you know, and Josie kind of gets this idea like, we should, you should help me and things like that. And of course, uh, Alexandra, Alexandra, you know, still tries to break them up, tries to put them against each other because because it's almost still about Josie, me, 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 you know, and she she has to realize that she is not she's not a solo artist now. She's in a band, and it's really good. Marjorie Bennett does a good job of selling that, and more importantly, uh, the, the Josie realizes that. Valerie is the one with the voice. Put her up front. Way different than the than the cartoon, which I thought was really good. And they do meet Alan at the end. And Alan is a lot different in this, but I thought it was really good. Um, this was really good. A good start to this series. Um, I do recommend it. If you're a Josie and a Pussycats fan, you'll like this. Um... And then it also has a classic comic in the back with the classic art and everything like that, which was really cool. Uh, but this was good. I very much enjoyed it. I even told Marjorie Bennett, I tweeted her this uh, very much. Um, hopefully, I think Miss Bennett is going to be at Comic-Con this Thursday, um, this week. And hopefully I may take this and to get it, try to get it signed by her. Um, but yeah, this was this was good. I very much enjoyed it. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to Dark Horse. And of course, we move on to probably one of the greatest barbarian characters ever to creep, ever to be created. Thank you, Mr. Robert E. Howard. Um, Conan, the Slayer, uh, Culling Bun, and Sergio Davella does the artwork. This, this is straight up Conan to the extreme in this issue. So Conan and his men were ambushed and taken by what seems to be demons and they are cannibal demons they, they they eat people and things like that and conan has been captured and taken to the demon's mother and the demon mother is basically telling conan you know you know you're unlike the other humans and everything like that um you will bear me children yeah, and I'll show you what she looks like, or what, uh, let's see, let me see if I get a good picture of her, um, or what Conan sees her looking like, this is what Conan sees of her, that's what he sees, but they, it finds out that Conan discovers that maybe they're not demons, maybe they're not trolls, they're, they're human, they're just sorcerers, you know, they're just, they're human, but they can play tricks with your eyes. Because at one point, you know, Conan's like, I wouldn't touch you with anything like that. And you're hideous. And she's like, maybe I got a way of changing my And then she turns into this beautiful woman. And then it's just like, okay, what is going on? Conan figures that out. See, he's not dumb, people. Conan's not an idiot. He's no fool. And um, he figures that out. And meanwhile, Conan's companions that are still alive... Are trying to figure out is Conan still alive? Is he is he dead? Things like that. And uh, the the her sons are out there just guarding them, and they're like like once mother gives the word we're gonna eat you and things like that. And um, once again they're being they're looked at as through the eyes of Conan's companions being trolls or uh, demons that just come from the water and then eat and then go back in the water and things like that. Uh, but Conan for that, and then Conan just goes wreck shit, wrecks havoc on these guys after he escapes from their mother. And man, does he he goes true blooded Conan. You know what it is. You, you love when he does it. It's just wreck havoc, and he takes out all of them except for one, the mother, and he leaves behind one of the companions because. He, he found out the truth and uh, he's like he tells the, uh, the the witch 
or so he's like oh you want to you want someone to sire your more children here's your guy and he just leaves conan leaves that one guy and takes the other two the prince and uh back to confront his brother who set them up but this was really good uh i very much enjoyed this i'm a i'm a big conan fan so uh and these covers are just beautiful if you get a good look at those covers um but uh yeah this is just good stuff uh conan the slayer number three let's move on keep it going with dark horse and uh boom studios actually this is a crossover um we have tarzan on planet of the apes this is issue number one tim seeley and david walker do the writing uh fernando uh dagnino i believe um and sandra milana Melino, melina excuse me uh molina uh does the i believe the artwork and inking uh but that cover is beautiful so what is this this is is this tarzan in the universe of planet of the apes um from what i got from it sorry about that it was my phone <laughs> i got a message uh sorry about that um but from what i got from this first of all the writing was beautiful the artwork even better but from what i got from this it's more of i guess it's the the planet of the apes zera and um uh, who was Zira and um, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Uh, Zira and um, I'm trying to remember. Um, Cornelius had come to the Tarzan's world. That's where it seems to be, that they transisted time and space and have come to Tarzan's world. Um, it takes, it showcases one side, it showcases 2016. I'm like, well, Tarzan's still around then. And then it showcases 1901, I believe. 1901, West Africa, uh, Equator, West Africa, 1901. And in there we see Tarzan Young uh, with uh cornelius and zira's son and um their training and things like that and we could see kerchak and um and uh uh kerchak and many of the other mangani gorillas in here and um tarzan and them start running to dinosaurs and it's almost like they're telling kerchak that's what we saw Kerchak doesn't believe them. Tarzan flips out on Kerchak. Kerchak just flips out on Tarzan and says, I'll crush your head and everything. I'm like, shit. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but it seems that Zira and Cornelius have transisted, transcended time and space to come to Tarzan's world. That's, that's kind of the vibe I got from it. And by doing so, they have kind of messed up almost the space-time continuity. Now, dinosaurs are coming through into this world and things like that and we get to see john clayton um a tarzan's cousin um or blood relative and pretty much here and things like that a lot of things are happening and it keeps flipping back from the past and the present and uh which was it was still really good i very much enjoyed this um being a big tarzan fan and i am um and I do like, I do love Planet of the Apes. So, um, it this was a good story. Uh, Tim Saley and David Walker did a good job with this. Uh, thank you for this. This was really good. I'm continuing to read this. Um, you guys did an excellent job with this. I thought this was really good. Uh, Tarzan Planet, on Planet of the Apes. Well, like I said, could be different. Could be Tarzan on the Planet of the Apes world, or i um, it's 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 kind of confusing that sometimes, but it is what it is. So we go back, so we, uh, we're we on Joe Benez, uh, Benet's uh, production, and this is his creation, and I've been loving his creation. Every time I read it, all I hear is <laughs> Kate Beckinsale, uh, but uh, we're back to 
the next volume of Lady Mechanica and um, get a good look at that cover because this cover means something. Lady Mechanica number one, uh, La Dama de la Muerte. Uh, that's the name of this uh, this volume. So Lady Mechanica is has taken a trip to a small Mexican village and she's down there because in some ways she has lost somebody. Um, she's lost somebody that she cared about. His name was Dallas and um, she comes to the small Mexican village on the time of when they celebrate the Day of the Dead. Um, uh, and uh, she's really confused about this. She doesn't really understand it. Why Why would you celebrate something like this? And, you know, this elderly woman, you know, basically explains to Mechanica why. You know, why this is, why we do this and everything like that. Which is really good. It's very educational if you're not familiar of the Day of the Dead and why the Mexican people and people like that, this, or, you know, celebrate that. And it's really educational. I thought that was really good for, uh, I think Joe Benz wrote this. Uh, I believe he wrote this. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, she, she, she's down there and she starts to, she meets the grandchildren of this um, hostess that she's staying in their hotel and everything. And she, she starts to realize, you know, she, and it and starts to understand it more. And everything seems to be going well and everything like that. She gets her face painted up and, and she joins them in the celebration and gives rest and pays homage to her friend Dallas who died and you know they they are not scared of her the people are not scared of her she because she wears remember she wears these goggles because her eyes are like kind of like gambits you know they're red and black and you know she she wears them so nobody will stare at them you know remember she's like it's steampunk s you know her arms are mechanical arms and things like that but she, you know, the, the woman's like, let's take these off. And she's like, no, you know, I wear these, you know, because my I have a condition and things like that. And it's not contagious, but I wear these. And, you know, the elderly woman just says, you know, it's okay. You know, it's all right. You know, she takes it on. She sees me and she's like, you can be yourself around here. We're not going to judge you. And I thought that was really good. That they're, they're not judging her. You know, they're not saying, oh, you know, you know, uh, you're you're an outsider, you know. But no, they're just, they're saying welcome to our village, you know, c celebrate with us, things like that. And I thought that was really well done. And it ends on a like it starts off being very pleasant, and uh, and then it just ends. It goes full blown horror real quick, um, because uh, yeah, in celebrating the dead, let's say the dead has risen. I'm gonna spoil that right there. But this was good. Uh, so far, I've loved all the volumes of uh, Lady Mechanica, and like I said, all I see when I hear, when I read this, is Kate Beckinsale's voice coming out of her. I don't know. Am I putting, I'm saying, hey, if she gets a uh, turn at maybe a movie, hey, look for Kate Beckinsale to do it, but I don't know. It's just, I hear Kate Beckinsale's voice when I'm reading Lady Mechanica. All right, so let's move on to uh, chap uh, chap Chapter House Comics. We're going to kick this off with uh, Captain Canuck, number nine, uh, Andre Sofsky, and Kirk to still do the writing and the artwork. Um, this was fun. Uh, the captain has has uh, teamed up with Blue Fox, this woman right here, and um, they realize that, and the captain's organization that he works for, um, what is what is his? What is this organization called again? Um, uh, PAC. Uh, basically realized that maybe one of their own is not who they say they are, thanks to a little information by the CIA. And um, this member is a member of this group called the Redcoats. And we're not talking about the Civil War and everything like uh, We're not talking about the Revolutionary War and everything like that. No, we're talking about We're talking about something else, uh, another group. Uh, but pretty much uh, the captain and Blue Fox, who seems to really um, like the captain, but and trusts the captain. And uh, unfortunately, this woman right here tries to kill Blue Blue Fox, 
and the captain's like, no, we don't do it like that. That's not how we, we're, you know, we put your differences aside and we get answers. And she's like, screw that, you know. And um, thanks to uh, the captain's partner, Quebec, who is pretty much a sharpshooter and she can just peck, pick off anything real quick. Uh, really cool. I love her. She's just, she's like no joke. She's like the female dead shot. Like she just pick you off like with her long rifle, you know, and all he, all captain has to do is just say her name, Quebec, and she just ping and you just see something go flying and it's her. Um, but uh, this was really good. Uh, fun as always. It ends with the captain interacting with another Canadian, the new Canadian, newest Canadian hero on the block, North Star, North Guard. Well, I say North Star, North Guard. Excuse me, North Guard. Uh, and it still so continues there. That's where it ends. But this was good, very good. And speaking of North Guard, <laughs> yeah, here we go. North Guard number two. Um, look who's on the cover. Yeah, um, Falcon, Falcon and Sells. And yeah, uh, pretty much here. It's. Uh, it showcased once again that uh, basically in this that is Quebec she's in this issue um, Quebec has been sent in by the creator of this suit that the suit that uh, North North Guard North Guard wears to retrieve it North Guard is on a mission uh, that takes him into rule I would say Montana or what is, it, what is it Montana? Is it is it Montana? Um, I believe it's Montana. Uh, rule. Yeah. Is it? Oh, oh. Excuse me. Uh, rule Oregon. Uh, Salem actually. Salem, Oregon. Uh, because red. Aurora Dawn, that's what he's trying to get some information. But he finds out that it's kind of a cult that he's after. And this cult is just really crazy. You know, just, you know, this end of the world, you know, those kind of sick cults that, you know, we we prepare for the end of the world, the fascists of these worlds will die and blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that kind of shit, that one hit shit, stuff like that. Excuse me. And um, that's where uh, Quebec makes her move. I kept saying Quebec, I meant Quebec, um, and makes her move and tries to take the suit by force, and, uh, you know, it's because of that, their North Guard's mission kind of goes sour real quick because of Quebec's interference, um, and they get captured by this cult, however, they're able to escape, and Quebec shot, uh, Quebec shot, uh, North Guard with, a, I believe, a Trank dart, I think it was a dart that made his arm dead so he can't use his his abilities you know and you know use his false concussion blast and everything like that so it's up to Quebec you Quebec to aim his arm and everything is crazy uh, but they are able to escape and when they escape pretty much uh, he explains to Quebec and tells the man who sent him Michael that he used to work for is that you can't take this suit even if you tried to and she's just like, oh yeah, really? Why? So basically we find out, and I'm going to read it to you right here because I think it's necessary. Um, he tells, he's like, she's like, she's like, I was sent to get the, the Unibans and are you going to give them to me? And he says, no, and I'm not sure you could take it, but you won't, you won't for two reasons. And he says one, he says one right here. He says, one, the the Unibans only respond to my DNA and brain waves now, so Mike can't even use it. And two, you know I'm right about Michael now. He because the guy, him and Michael, the guy that they he worked for, you know, is kind of gone a little bit off his rocker in a sense. So, and he, that's what he feels like. He doesn't, he can't take these. And that's how, you know, it ends. It pretty much ends there. And Quebec disappears. You know, she pulls her, her just 
gone. And you don't even see her disappear. He turns around, and she's gone. But uh, this was good. This was good altogether. The next issue looks like um, if you can't do it yourself, pretty much. If you can't send, send, you can't do it. Send somebody else to do it. I'll do it myself. Michael, I guess, is gonna come after uh, Northgard to take back what he feels is his. Good stuff. All right, so let's move on to Joe Books um, and number five of Darkwing Duck. Darkwing Duck, uh, <laughs> number five, uh, Sparrow. And I've talked to, um, I've talked to Aaron Sparrow on Twitter and I've told him you keep writing this book like you've been doing and you'll always have my support on this this is just just fun stuff it just just is classic if you grew up loving Darkwing Duck if you are in my age racket you grew up you were born in the 80s you grew up in the 80s and also the 90s and you saw all the good stuff from the 90s this is still gonna be it so in this book pretty much Darkwing is telling a story of how he met one of his new villains, the Gosling Honker, and also fixing up his his files, you know, of his his criminal files, and the the the, the uh, villain that he's talking about is uh, Fluffy, this cute little kitten who is more than meets the eye, and uh, you get a lot of <laughs> just interesting stuff. I love I love the scene where. Uh, He's telling Gosling and Honker about how he met the some of the fearsome five, and uh, you know Mega du you know Mega Vault and Liquidator and Bushroot, Tusker Nini was there and they're watching pay per view, <laughs> and that was so funny. I thought that was hilarious, but it's pretty much that's the pretty much gist of it. You know, pretty much uh, Darkwing, you know, telling Gosling and Honker a story, you know, of how they met Fluffy. And, you know, at the end, how he should have taken Fluffy maybe a little bit more seriously and things like that. Uh, but, yeah, you can see Fluffy right there. That, that cute little kitten up stop about to drop that anvil on Dark Queen's head. But uh, this was just fun. Just good stuff. Good. Just I nothing to complain about. Nothing at all. Good stuff, guys. Everybody who's working on this, Mr. Sparrow. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Silvani, Mr. Little, Hop and Mr. Hopkins, all you guys, good stuff. All right, let's move on to Udon Comics with Street Fighter Unlimited. First of all, I always love these these Genzo covers. These Genzo covers are fucking beautiful. Even though you got that fucker urine on a cover, I hate Gil. I said urine. I'm urine is his brother. I hate fucking Gil. But in this. Uh, this is issue number 10, so it's Gil versus Evil Ryu. And, uh... Yeah, Gil gets the upper hand on Re Evil Ryu. I'm not gonna sit here and bullshit you guys. Did I like it? Fuck no. But he's trying to tell everybody, you know, this is... You won't spoil my paradise and everything like that. When Everything... He's... He's talking about utopia and everything like that my way if you don't follow you'll be my slave and Yuren makes his move his brother makes his move does it go well I'm not gonna ruin that who else gets involved Al Alex gets involved and supposedly defeats Gil however it showcased that Gil is not so easily defeated because Gil actually I'm gonna spoil the hell out of this one right here guy Gil actually, I guess, jumps into the body of Alex. And Alex becomes Gil, I guess. And that's basically... He, everybody is like, you know, all hell, Gil, and everything, but not other, not all the other memorable characters of Street Fighter, like, screw your utopia, you know, we're not going to be your slaves and anything like that, so it becomes, booyah, check that out, look at that cover, look at that big panel, the Street Fighter 
all the members of the Street Fighters, like, we're going to take you on. So it's Gil versus the rest of the cast. Hopefully Ryu will get out of his icy, icy uh, prison and uh, join back in the fight as well. But uh, this was good. And then the, the side story is uh, Ken selling his uh, his likeness, I guess, uh, to a, a uh, to like a, a side story is Ken selling his um his likeness to a, a film company, and they make this thing called Street Fighter 2010. And Ken Masters is like a he's like a. Uh, <laughs> it's like a he's like a, a a warrior and he's fighting like cyber metal Zangief and uh, cyber Akuma and things like that. So and it's a story. It, and at the end you see uh, Ken, Eliza, and his son Mel uh, watching it, and things like that. But this was good, very good. No teaser of the Street Fighter versus Darkstalkers uh, crossover that's coming. I'm looking forward to. It. Last time there was one. All right, so let's move on to Vertigo, and we move on to Frostbite. Uh, uh, I think this is Josh Williamson, and Ale uh, who, who does the artwork? I want to make sure I get Josh, Josh, uh, Joshua Williamson, and Jason S Jason Sean Alexander uh, does the artwork. I saw this and I was like, this looks interesting. Let me read it. I want to check it out when I was looking at this list station at mid Midtown. So what's, what is this? Basically, Frostbite is the second Ice Age has hit. And it's hit hard. And it is taken many. And the surviving human race are surviving as best they can. And I put the emphasis on surviving because heat, warmth is truly a means of currency, a means of survival, and uh, it's showcasing this very well. We have one of the main characters here. Her name is uh, Keenan. Uh, her last name is uh, Keaton, and she is kind of like a slash bounty hunter, if you want to say that. And she's taking a job to find somebody, and uh, she finds out that that person is kind of the person responsible for the second ice age but what also is the title frostbite does play a, a bit into this because frostbite is not is more than just you know um it is a condition it is a disease in this world where if you have frostbite you literally your body becomes very cold and icy think of ice man but it can kill you and we see that in this very much. It's not like your whatever limb becomes very dark and black because of the blood vessels of dead. That's what frostbite is. We see it. Your your limb is all black and you know you don't feel anything anymore. No, this frostbite and this is like a disease. If you catch it, uh, you, you turn blue like Iceman and you become solid and it, it's contagious. So people, want, if you are killed, you are just solid ice. It's it's like ugh, but this was really good very dramatic on the side and it's scary at times because it's like what if a second ice age did hit would we be prepared for it i've always said no we wouldn't but this was this was very good give joshua williams a lot of credit this was really good I very much enjoyed this all right and so we move on to valiant and uh we move on to fred van lint and issue number two of Generation Zero. So, uh, we are the future. So, once again, um, Keisha, Keisha Thomas, has uh, enlisted the help of Generation Zero to find the uh, the corner man. Uh, yeah, the, the, the corner man. She feels because her boyfriend was killed. And uh, we're getting to see more of the... Uh, and where we left off before is Keisha has come into contact with the corner men and thanks to Generation Zero she was able to to get out of it safely her father who is a sheriff of this small uh, town where, where are they 
this small town in um, Minis Michigan, I believe. I believe it's Michigan. And it's called Rook, Michigan. And uh, he confronts the three members of um, of, uh, of of Generation Zero, pretty much. And, um, and he kind of goes a little full-blown out there with them. Uh, but still the team they still do their job you know even though you know they don't even though they got roughed up by Keisha's dad you know and they still do their job try to figure out who is the one responsible for killing Keisha's boyfriend and um, Keisha meets the fourth member and the fourth member is uh, what is her name the fourth member is her name is uh, Cloud, and she's she's a uh, she's a uh, telepath, I guess you could say. She can read minds and things like that. But she's kind of I don't want to say she's kind of out there. Like sometimes it makes it, the way they wrote it, the way Van Lint wrote it was almost like Cloud. The engine's running, but nobody is there. But she can see the future, and she knows that Keisha and her are going to be good friends and everything like that. And so when she sees Keisha, she runs up to her and hugs her and things like that. And, you know, uh, the members tell her that we have a, your first suspect of who could have killed your boyfriend. And it's kind of like the, the the most popular girl in the school, but she's also a bitch. And uh, when, Keisha and them see, when Keisha sees it, that they have her... And then she's like, "Oh, perfect, you know." But this was fun. This is this is good. I, I'm liking this so far. Um, so far, uh, who is my favorite member of the four? I don't know right now. But each one of them has some cool powers. Um, animal is, I guess, like he can transform his arms and anything into a different animal. Um, but uh, it, 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 they're fun. They're fun. This is fun. Uh, Generation Zero, really good. <clears throat> Grim Fairy Tales Apocalypse number two of five, Mr. Shant. My love and respect to you, sir. Uh, this was good. This was good. Uh, the the horsemen have arrived. They're wrecking up shit. Um, the team is divided. Robin and Marion. I've never seen Robin and Marion like this. Um, to the point where. They get physical with each other. Robin shoves Marion so hard at one point because of what's gone down that she, Robin can't like. Oh my God! I'm uh, Marion's face sold it, but unfortunately, Marion's wife. Remember, Marion's married. Basically, is like Mary. If you ever touch my wife again, I'll break your neck. I was like, shit, like. And it's scary to see that. It was just like, wow, Marion and Robin have been through so much. And to see them see them get physical with each other is scary. And the team is now divided. They're divided on how to stop the horsemen. And what's that old saying? Divided they stand, divided they fall. Could this be what could this be what happens between them? And will they, will marry, the real question I always, I have for this is, will they be able to succeed in stopping the horsemen? And also, what will be the relationship between Marion and Robin afterwards? Those are good questions to ask yourself. If you've been reading Robin Hood from start to finish, to the get-go, like I have, you, you, you wonder about that. But this was really good. Mr. Shant, you do a good job on this. Um, it's good to see you write Robin again, even though yeah, you're it's but I'm I'm growing accustomed to not seeing your name under a Robin Hood title. Um it's still hard, but it's I, I um and the people that are doing Robin Hood now are doing a good job. I'm not gonna deny that. But she'll always be your baby. This is this, this is good stuff. Good stuff here. Uh number two of uh Grim Fairy Tales Apocalypse. Uh, three more issues to go.
But anyway, that is it, guys. That is all the indie books that I covered, guys, for for the week of uh, the last week of September. I will see you guys with the next um, parts, which will be the DC part for what I picked up for the what was that the 29th of September, the last week, and of course the Marvel. And uh, once again, other than that, remember this will be the last reviews on my main channel. You want to continue to watch my reviews? You go to my comic central channel that's where my reviews will be but other than that guys this is mom running kids saying peace when love stay tuned keep it real as always i'll catch you guys next time <laughs> i'm sorry i'm out y'all take care guys